Nous avons le plaisir d'accueillir Sylvia Loretti. Donc, Sylvia Loretti est docteur en histoire de l'art, diplômée du Courtauld Institute of Art de Londres. Euh, Sylvia Loretti a été assistant curator au département de peinture et sculpture du MoMA, en charge des préparatifs de l'exposition Picasso's Culture sous la direction d'Anne Tempkin et d'Anne Oumland. Elle a euh, préparé cette, euh, cette chronologie détaillée des, des, des sculptures que vous euh, trouvez dans, dans le catalogue, qui a été ensuite reprise par euh, Louise Malheur et, et moi-même. Et Sylvia Loretti nous présente aujourd'hui euh, une étude euh, de la transposition des plâtres de bois gelou en ciment et en bronze. Merci Virginie, euh, et merci aussi à, à Cécile et à Julie pour avoir organisé ces colloques. Uh, Picasso's 1932 retrospectives, so, mon intervention sera en, en anglais, mais je prendrai volontiers des questions en français aussi à la fin. Picasso's 1932 retrospectives at the Galerie Georges Petit in Paris and at the Kunsthaus Zurich were largely commercial enterprises. The Paris leg of the show was unofficially so, Wilhelm Wartmann, the director of the Kunsthaus Zurich, had to annotate prices by hand in his copy of the Georges Petit catalogue. His expanded version of the exhibition, however, was often intended for profit. The only four sculptures that traveled from Paris to Switzerland, here under plastique, were all marked in print in the Zurich catalogue as Verkauflich, for sale then still cast in bronze by Ambrose Vollard in an unnumbered edition that represented a selection of Picasso's earliest sculptures. Included at Georges Petit, but absent from the Kunsthaus retrospective, were the three unique pieces that Picasso had made in collaboration with Julio González at the time of the 1930s. The painted iron sculptures, Head of a Woman and Woman in a Garden, and Gonzalez's bronze cast of the latter. The painted iron, Woman in a Garden, appears here in a series of installation photographs that Margaret Scolari Barr, Alfred H. Barr's Jr.'s wife, brought back from her visit to Georges Petit. Barr himself had stayed in New York, but he promptly annotated the photographs with titles, dates, and owners for each work. As Michael Fitzgerald has shown, Barr had plans to bring the 1932 retrospective to MoMA, but this fell through in favor of the more profitable Kunsthaus exhibition. Acknowledging the absence of Picasso's recent sculpture from Zurich, Wartmann wrote in his catalog, quote, Picasso is a sculptor from time to time. Like in his painting, here too he attains to technical processes, materials and forms that share little with the millennial tradition of the sculpture studio. This is why he would not let this part of his work slip away from his hands. What Wartman seemed to ignore was that Picasso's most jealously kept sculptures, absent from both Zurich and Paris, were in fact his numerous and most recent works in the round, created within the traditional space of the studio. Here photographed in broad daylight by Picasso himself. In autumn 1930, he had begun to model larger than life disproportionate female figures in plaster. In the converted stables of his recently acquired castle at Guajelou, Normandy. There, he reverted to modeling an earth-based material for the first time since the clay sculptures that he had sold to Ambrose Vollard in 1910. It has often, often been said that the reason for the absence of the Boisgelou sculptures from the 1932 retrospectives lies in Picasso's fear of Olga's reaction as to the place that Marie-Thérèse occupied within that oeuvre. This seems to be largely a myth. Not only did Picasso exhibit um, paintings, unequivocally inspired by Marie-Thérèse, some of them referencing the Boisgelou sculptures in his retrospectives. Recently discovered photographs revealed that Olga was fully aware, aware of her husband's sculptural work at Boisgelou prior to the exhibitions. 
Tellingly, Olga was among the party that Picasso drove to Boisgelou that famous day in December 1932 when Brassais photographed the sculpture studio for the first issue of Minotaur. It was through these photographs, as well as those taken by Bernes Moroto in winter 1934 and published in a special issue of Cahiers d'Art two years later, that the Boisgelou sculptures and Picasso sculpture studio became widely known. As they retained the intimate recursiveness of Picasso's creative environment while projecting it to, an outside world, to the outside world, the photographs created the myth of the sculptor's secrecy, while effectively replacing the traditional function of plaster and bronze for the reproduction and dissemination of sculpture. That Picasso himself took suggestive photographs of his sculpture studio in 1931-32 supports Catherine Chevillot's thesis that, quote, the use of plaster as a reproductive material dwindled with the increased use and sophistication of photography. Around 1900, Rodin had freed plaster from its traditional status as a substitute for absent originals when he began to exhibit his workshops large but fragmentary plasters as independent works of art. The autonomy of plaster as a sculptural material in its own right was to be further defended by the modernist theory of truth to material. Sharon Hacker has demonstrated how Rodin's contemporary Medardo Rosso drew metaphorically on plaster's ambivalent status as a material expressing at once stability and fragility for its capacity to harden quickly, but also, once dry, to be easily shattered into pieces. Picasso's plasters easily transmitted the sacred atmosphere which precise works so vividly captured. Sculpture and photographer drew on the haptic and visual effects of plaster to transfigure the large multi-perspective sculptures into goddesses as white as marble and as luminous as ivory, especially when dramatically lit and encountered in the inside-outside space of the studio or through black and white photography. Their overall effect is one of a mystical experience in line with classical theories such as Herder's Pygmalion essay, which speculated on the origins of ancient Greek statues in the massive cult images emerging slowly out of darkness in the inner sanctuary of temples. Sensitive to the sculpture's fragility and sacred statues, Barr did not dare to ask for the Boisgelou plasters when he finally got to mount his own Picasso retrospective at MoMA in 1939. Instead, he put all his efforts into persuading the artist and his associates, quote, to secure a representative group of his recent sculptures, and to make sure that Picasso would follow through with, quote, having some of his sculptures cast especially for the exhibition, end of quote. Eventually, Barr only managed to show a handful of sculptures up to 1930, with the Boisgelou sculptures um, included in the catalog through Gallatin's iconic, iconic image of the studio. Yet, research conducted in Moma's archives in preparation for Picasso's sculpture has brought to light Barr's success at convincing Picasso to cast some of the Boisgelou plasters for 40 years of his art. A letter from Christian Zervos to Barr ahead of the exhibition opening mentions Koch, uh, here uh, um, shown at the Salon de la Libération after the war. And in the letter, Zervos expressed his regret that these and, quote, other sculptures by Picasso cast in bronze, magnificent pieces that would have looked wonderful in your museum and would have enriched your exhibition, end of quote, could not be sent to MoMA due to the outbreak of the war and Picasso's sudden departure for Royan. These works had been cast by Valsuani in 1939 and were to be collected by Kahnweiler on Picasso's behalf in summer 1940, together with a few of the artist's plasters. The Valsuani foundry had been closed because of the war, there was fear that it might be bombed. The same fear prompted Picasso, for all his reticence, to cast most of the Boisgelou plasters in bronze despite the restrictions enforced by the Germans on the use of bronze for the casting of objets d'art. A few months before Paris was occupied, he had several of his plasters that had been left at Boisgelou 
or at the Valsuani foundry, as well as the bronzes already cast by Valsuani, such as Koch, brought to his Paris studio at number 7 Rue de Grandes Augustin. In autumn 1940, after his return from Royan, he had at least three other bronzes cast by Guastini. Judging from their descriptions and approximate dimensions, the bronzes may have been the Boisgelou head of a woman, bust of a woman, and head of a warrior. Now, Claire Finn just said that head of a warrior was actually cast by Valsuani after the war. So this was a bit of a speculative argument um, on my part. Um, Bressay expressed his disappointment at seeing the Boisgelou heads cast in bronze when he visited Picasso at the Grands Augustins in September 1943. So by that date, um, a number of Boisgelou heads had already been cast. The first sculpture here um, is described by Guastini in his letter as actually being head of a man, but something similar had also happened with the 1909 head of a woman in the catalogue of the 1932 Zurich exhibition, where it's described as bust of a man. The 1939 head of a woman and bust of a woman had been previously cast in cement for the Spanish Republic Pavilion at the 1937 Paris World Fair, where they featured, um, when, where they were featured on the second floor together with Bather, which had been cast in um, bronze by Valsuani. Two more cement casts of a more monumental statue, woman with a vase and head of a woman stood outside the pavilion. Cement was then a medium more closely associated with the origins and development of modern architecture for its industrial origins, low production costs, and rapidity to set. Its hybrid nature, at once liquid and rock solid, seemed to reflect modern identity. Picasso aptly chose the material to translate his private goddesses into public monuments in defense of democracy's ideals. Indeed, the materials in which he chose to disseminate, disseminate exhibit and preserve his Boisgelou sculptures reflect his interest in experimenting with the categories of unique and multiples and private and public in sculpture and the possibilities offered by new interpretations of both traditional and modern media. The original Boisgelou sculptures, modeled and carved in plaster, resisted the aesthetic and commercial logic of this material as a transitory step towards the reproduction of sculpture in more solid and durable forms, marble or bronze. This logic was inextricably associated with the post-industrial surge of bronze statuary during the 19th century. On the one hand, this took the form of private commodities, the so-called mantelpiece statuettes that were cast in series by editors dealers such as Vola, and whose bourgeois aesthetic was embraced by Olga Picasso and mimicked by her husband in their respective Rue de la Boetie apartment apartments. On the other hand, Reproductive sculpture was reflected in a vertiginous rise in public commissions during the Third Republic, a statue mania which came under attack in the late 1920s and early 1930s among Picasso's surrealist friends. The surrealists entertained an ambivalent attitude towards public monuments. On the one hand, they celebrated public sculptures for the imaginative possibilities that it offered to a surrealist experience of the modern city, as evidenced in the key text of surrealism, particularly Breton's trilogy Naja, Communicating Vessels, and La Fou, that make extensive use of photography. On the other hand, the surrealists were critical of the ideological function of monuments. They entertained an antagonistic relationship with the individualized bronze statues and busts of Paris, for this conveyed in their view a falsely unified idea of history. To bronze, which they criticized as a dead and natural material, they opposed model sculpture in malleable media such as clay and plaster. Bronze has a long associative history with the expression of power, both military and civil, having been used since prehistoric times for the making of weapons and since the Middle Ages for the casting of town bells and cannonballs. A man-made shape-shifting compound 
The material has a mythical dimension for its plasticity and association with the human capacity to modify nature. A case in point is Benvenuto Cellini's histrionic account of the casting of his Perseus, in which bronze is endowed with life-giving powers. Aptly, bronze was the material chosen in classical antiquity for the representation of heroes. The translation of the Boisgelou plasters into unique bronzes before and during the war extended these associations, leading to, a trans to the transformation of a traditional sculptural medium and the processes involved in its making into subtly, sub subtly sub subversive acts. For Picasso, who, like most past industrial sculptors, painters in particular, relied on highly skilled founders for the making of his bronzes, the creation of unique pieces reflected the will to collaborate with craftsmen in order to preserve his sculptures. Plaster is perishable, Sabartes reminded him during the war. Bronze is forever. Bronze also allowed him to keep his work close and to continue to experiment with it. As a painter, he was interested in the ability of bronze to reflect light. He sometimes intervened in the patination of his bronzes, although in a skilled, untraditional, and even irrever irreverent ways. He repeatedly and proudly reported his attempt to improve the appearance of his bronzes by pissing on them. Insight into Picasso's choice of bronze is provided once again by the photographs that Brassai and others took of his studio, this time in Paris at the Rue des Grands Augustins. Having left Boisgelou as part of his separation settlement with Olga and under surveillance as a degenerate artist during the war, Picasso surrounded himself with his cherished sculptures that once translated into bronze performed the function of a defensive army in the face of hostilities. Contrary to the ominous Third Republic pantheon of individualized portrait heads and busts scattered around Paris and shaping the country's collective memory, the Boisgelou bronzes presented themselves as a crowd of anonymous, if familiar, heroes. United in their material uniform that emphasizes uh, sameness, they emphasize sameness in substance, substance over difference in appearance. At the same time, their transmutation from the white plasters of the bright Boisgelou stables to the dark bronzes hidden in the Saint Grand Augustin engendered a sense of estrangement and defamiliarization akin to the effects sought by surrealist theories of the objects. Of the object. At first, Picasso's use of traditional sculpture processes and media in the 1930s and early 1940s may seem to contradict the surrealist idea of sculpture. Yet, his experiments in translating the Boisgelou sculptures into metaphorically charged materials attest to the dynamics of desire, engagement, and resistance that underlie his modernist reinvention of serious sculpture into ever unique works. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Sylvia. Donc, nous avons bien vu dans cette présentation uh, le lien uh, qu'entretenaient les reproductions des sculptures de Picasso en bronze et en ciment et uh, leur diffusion dans le cadre notamment des, des expositions. Donc, nous avons uh, aperçu uh, l'exposition uh, du Salon de la Libération, nous, uh, le projet uh, d'Alfred Bard d'exposer de, les sculptures de Picasso euh, et euh, ce dont nous avons déjà parlé euh, à plusieurs reprises ce matin, leur euh, traduction en ciment dans le cadre de l'exposition internationale de Paris en 1937 devant le pavillon espagnol. Je vous pose à nouveau une question qui a été euh, soulevée ce matin et on a paru, dont on n'a pas réussi à à, à trouver euh, la réponse qui était euh, pourquoi euh, cette, euh, la reproduction de, de ces plâtres de bois gelou en, en ciment euh, est un phénomène euh, isolé et pourquoi euh, Picasso n'a pas euh, davantage généralisé la reproduction euh, en ciment um, One could say why is Gavnica a unique case in Picasso's own mm -hmm. but um, perhaps because he realized that actually um, cement was not such a durable form as mm -hmm. it was, um, as he had expected and as it was believed to be mm -hmm. um, at the time. And 
in fact, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the cement sculptures are very fragile, right? Effectivement, contrairement à ce qu'on pense habituellement, les, les ciments sont eux aussi euh, fragiles, donc certainement moins que, que les plâtres, c'est sûr, mais, euh, mais néanmoins, en fait, euh, les, les armatures étant souvent des armatures métalliques s'oxydant, les, les ciments euh, ont, ont aussi euh, leur fragilité, leur souci de, de conservation. Carmen Jiménez Oui, en, en 1985, j'ai organisé en Espagne le 50e anniversaire de ce pavillon espagnol. Euh, Guernica, bien sûr, était au, au Prado à l'époque, enfin, au, pas au Prado même, mais dans le dans le dans l'annexe, disons, du Prado. Et, et j'avais donc euh, fait toute une recherche sur ce fameux pavillon, et donc sur, en particulier sur les sculptures. Donc, on avait fait une recherche sur ces fameuse sculpture en ciment. Donc la, euh, la personne qui m'aidait, Joséphine Alix, euh, est, est partie, est venue à Paris. Moi, je l'ai accompagnée. Puis ensuite, c'est elle qui a mené toute la, la recherche parce que moi, j'étais directeur, j'avais du mal. Mais enfin, j'ai suivi ça de près parce que quand je suis arrivée au ministère, j'avais ramené la femme au vase et, 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 et Picasso n'était pas considéré sculpteur. Donc c'était même cette femme qui était spécialiste en, en, en sculpture. Elle, elle considérait Gonzalez, le grand sculpteur, pas du tout Picasso. Donc, il euh, y a toute une recherche et donc c'est là où on a retrouvé tous les papiers de José Gao qui avait demandé, qui avait, c'est l'Espagne qui a payé pour ces ciments parce que Picasso voulait exposer ses, ses, ses sculptures de bois gelou et, et donc, bien sûr, elles étaient très fragiles. Donc, je pense que Picasso a pris la, la décision de les, de les faire en ciment et c'est l'Espagne qui les a payés. Donc, ils, a, ils, ont, ils ont fait ces... Ces, ces, ces fonds, on, et ils ont, quand l'exposition est terminée, donc les, les quatre, les trois, les trois en ciment ont été retrouvés, euh, et, la, et la quatrième qui est la femme au vase, on ne sait pas du tout ce qui est arrivé. J'ai vraiment les documents euh, qui euh, expliquent euh, qu'il y a une compagnie qui est venue, française, qui est venue défaire les bases de ces. De ces... Peut-être qu'en défaisant ce bas, ces vases. Ils, euh, ils ont cassé la femme au vase, mais peut-être pas. Il euh, y a encore peut-être la chance. L'autre jour, je parlais avec, euh, on parlait ici à l'issue de toutes ces conversations que nous avons. Et il paraît que c'est possible encore de retrouver cette femme au vase. Il faudrait peut-être euh, la chercher en ciment. Merci, Carmen. Alors moi, là, je me tourne vers les spécialistes que nous, nous avons écouté ce matin. Est-ce que le ciment n'est pas, pas aussi un matériau plus économique qui, du coup, a été plus largement utilisé à cette période On sait que le, le temps de commande et de réalisation a, ont été très courts en 1937 pour la réalisation de ces quatre tirages en ciment. Est-ce que cette valeur économique n'a pas joué dans le, aussi dans le, le choix de ce matériau Est-ce qu'il était à la mode à cette époque Est -ce que, vous savez quelque chose, Elisabeth, ou je ne sais pas si euh, Jean-Louis Andral. Oui, du plâtre. Il y a, oui, il y a cet ce effet, je... ça ouais. c'est évident. Voilà. Oui, oui. Je pense que c'est oui. aussi important que l'éventuel aspect économique, c'est la, la ressemblance avec oui, le, oui. le plâtre d'origine. Voilà. Après, pourquoi il n'y en a pas eu plus euh, mais je pense que Picasso était très sensible à, à l'aspect euh, à la fois mat, il n'y avait pas la, la brillance, le côté un peu, un peu riche euh, du bronze, euh, voilà, cette espèce d'équivalence de, 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 oui, oui, avec le plâtre. Elisabeth Cowling, peut-être que... mmh. What, it, what, the, what the pavilion signified mm. using bronze would have been inappropriate. Mm. Yes. To say. Mm. Merci beaucoup, Sylvia. Merci, Merci Sylvia. 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 Merci Sylvia.